This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we're going to be cooperatively traveling around different areas together. It might be the plains region, or the mountains, or the forests, or the rivers. We're going to be traveling around the seventh continent. So today we're going to be taking a look at this game called The Seventh Continent. It's for one to four players. Uh, it takes eons to play. Uh, so let me show you this interesting game, how it's different from others, and I'll see you on the other side. The Seventh Continent's played over four different scenarios known as curses. And through all those different curses, you'll be pulling different card numbers from the stack in the game. There's also some reference cards here. Now there's many different characters you can choose from the game. Here's just two of them. You get to select a character. They'll give you a special ability throughout the game. And each character comes with five uh, action cards that will be shuffled into a main deck. You'll be able to attain these later and use the powers of these cards throughout the game. Typically, you'd start off at a specific spot depending on the curse you selected, but since this is an exploration game, I'm trying not to spoil too much. I'm just showing you a random card in the game. So you start on a specific spot, and then as you're together, you can go off and do things on your own, or you can do things together. So this is where we are, and anywhere that is adjacent to this, there'll be some fog depending on what area you're in. Now, when you can do different things on your turns, you can, uh, for example, you could uh, do this action, which is the spot and observe. And we can try to look at this, and if so, if, if we're successful, we'll get a new card of 133. Uh, or we could kind of from here, we could look to see what this is and flip it over uh, or flip this over. Now, the way this works is this shows you how many cards you'd need to flip over. And this shows you how many stars you'd need to get the success. Now, these are obviously zero, zero. So essentially, we could flip those over for free to see what's on the other side. Where this one shows us, we're going to have to flip over one plus, which means at least one of the action deck over. But we don't need to get any successes to get that. So what is this action deck all about? about. The action deck acts as a sort of a clock, if you will. So as you flip cards over, you're going to be going through this deck. You'll be able to get certain things that are usually good for you. But as you go through this deck, time's going to be ending. Because once you get through this entire deck, essentially you'll be shuffling through this and the game can end immediately in failure. So when you're flipping over these cards, you're trying to decide how many should we flip? How many should we not flip? Because depending on the challenge, you might need a certain amount of stars. This one doesn't need any, but you have to pull at least one card. Or if you needed certain cards, uh, a certain amount of stars, when you pull those over, uh, you'll get some cards will have stars, some will not. For example, this one has one and a half, where another card might have the other half of that, where you can put it together, and this is like two stars. Some of them will have no stars. Some, some of them will have these uh, other things that can help turn into stars called sevens. And in the game, in the rule book, they've actually showed you, depending on how many cards you draw, and depending on how many stars you want, there's a statistics as to what you want. So if I had to draw three cards to get three stars, there's only a 39% chance of doing this. But if I drew a fourth card, it goes up to 65. A fifth card, it goes up to 82. So in the entire game, you're trying to talk about how do we get either more cards or less stars needed, depending on using equipment or pulling more cards, to try to make it so that you are successful, because successful are, are good things that will typically give you things that are good for you and bad things typically are bad, but not always in this game. Now this specific action um, is a spot or observe and because it's more uh, thematic. So you're, you're, you're observing something in this tree and there's tons of different actions you could do in the game. They all use the same mechanism, which is just flipping cards, which is cool, but it allows it to be thematic and allows you to get a lot of different items that help you in these different types of tasks throughout the game. But instead of looking at that, let's first look what these sort of things do. Some things are good, like you could find a bamboo tube, which allows you to break off a little piece of bamboo, and you can use it to breathe underwater. And that's because if you were doing this anchor type of task, which is swimming or sailing, uh, you essentially could get an extra star, then you would discard this. Um, and the way this works is somebody could get it, they'd put a die on here, uh, and you could basically just use this as sort of an item. We'll get to items in just a moment. Uh, once these are resolved in either way, you'd then be able to put the item number, the, the number here, and you'll see what land this is. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to spoil things for you. Or sometimes it could be something like this. Hey, a handwritten page seems to have gotten miraculously caught in the branches of a pine tree. Take card 50 and then banish us out of the game. So sometimes it's going to bring out other cards. Sometimes you'll need to fight things like vicious birds where you're stuck 
fighting this bird. It's a mandatory uh, fight, and you have zero or more cards you can pull, so as many as you want, but you got to get three stars. And if you do, you'll get card 001. If not, you struggle and you end up taking a 101. And so thematic things happen with these. And again, generally, you're, you're flipping these over, finding new land. If you ever want to move from here, you have to flip over a certain amount of cards, get a certain amount of stars, depending on the, the land type you're on, and you can then move as far as you can on interlocked land. But let's say we wanted to look at this. It says, well, card 133. We got to flip one over, and we, we don't need any stars. Now, regardless of how many you flip over for a certain task, uh, between all of these, again, sometimes you're looking for a specific amount of stars. In this case, we didn't need any. But regardless of how many cards you flip over, one involved player, meaning who's doing the task, and even though we were both there, we could have decided just one of us to do it or all of us. Usually it's better for all of you to do it because it gives you some, you can, you can change the ratio of how many stars you need. Uh, but once you have these, one player can take one of these skill cards. Now, by default, you can only hold three of them. Some things will allow you to carry more. And this is an item as well. It's a woven basket. Uh, and so you can just keep this in, in your inventory. And if you're able to craft this, it says when this is in your inventory, this, items, uh, this part of an item may contain up to three additional item cards. Because there's only a certain amount of items you can carry. This would allow you to carry more. But how do you craft things? Well, you could take this action, which is you'd have to flip over three or more to get zero stars. Uh, but if you're on a land that has a specific type of resource, you get a discount. Now, the land that we're on gives wood. If it had given one of those two resources, we would have gotten a discount. And sometimes you can get it to the point where you can essentially craft it for free. Now, once you craft it, you take one of your dice. You never roll these dice. And it shows you how many times you can use this. Because once it's crafted, you can use it. In this case, it's just, uh, you know, we can have up to three additional item cards. Uh, but normally, uh, you know, you might craft it at a certain number that it might say. And then as you use it, it goes down. And then once you've used it the last time, it sort of dis gets discarded. Also, I want to point out that some of these cards uh, have these specific words on their keywords and certain uh, cards will interact with that uh, for example our character card here says hey you can discard a card with a keyword stealth from your hand in order to skip the consequent step of an action so there's different things that you can trigger and other cards that you know made up with certain cards uh, that have certain keywords it also helps when you combine items with the same keywords, you get some bonuses and such. But I, wanna, I don't want to go into all those details. So we've gotten through that challenge. We actually got an item out of it and somebody crafted it. Great. And now we're looking at card 133. Something is tangled in the high branches of a sparse tall tree. And then we take a look. And reaching the first branches to even start this climb might be the trickiest part of the ascent. So this is a climbing action. Again, you may have cards or abilities that allow you to change this and make it easier for you. You may have some items or equipment that allow you to do that. In this case, you have to draw three or more cards to get two stars. And if, you, if it's great, you get 160. If not, you end up losing, you know, you use one of your items uh, down two ticks. Essentially, you land on your item, which kind of breaks it a little bit. Uh, so this is the types of things that you'll be doing throughout the game. I'm not going to show what happens here. Now, we spoke about these different items and combining them together and such, and you get a satchel, the team does. Depending on the number of players, uh, whether it's four, three, two, or one, you get to have a certain amount of items. Like, let's say, for example, we were playing with these two players. You can hold up to three skill cards, three bonus cards that might come out, and then each of these dice, of these black things here, you can hold up to three different uh, sections of items, and you can have up to three items together there. They all share the same die. Uh, so as you use one pip, it actually goes down for all of them. Unless, again, they all have the same keyword, as I mentioned before, then you get to actually like, add them all up. It's pretty cool. But you get to keep all these here and keep track of how many things you can keep. Some cards actually give you choices on what to do. Like for this one, we could either get card 120 or 125. And some cards have these cool other icons on them, which means there's items that you may have gotten. Like maybe I had this raft. It's fully equipped. We could use it four times. And when we're doing sailing, it would give us some stars and such. But it also says square plus five. So we could either take go 120 and pull the 120 card. We could do the 125 or we could do the 125 plus five, which and then grab a 130 card uh, by using the raft. And so the different cards will interact with different equipment at certain times of the game. Now, I have this card down here for a reason. I don't want you to see the whole card because, again, I don't want to spoil anything. But the game actually comes with a magnifying glass. And sometimes you might be able to see just below that green there, you see a number 14. That means you could grab card number 14 and then replace it here. And then you found something new to look at. So those are sort of the basics of the game. Now, as you're taking cards from the action deck, you might come up with a curse card. Now, if it's going through this draw deck, it doesn't much matter. This just gets discarded. However, 
Once this entire deck has been discarded, you'll shuffle all these cards and make a face down discard pile. Then later on, if you're taking cards from this dis discard pile, because this is where you take them from now on, at that point, if you get a curse, well, the game is over. However, there are ways that you can pull cards out of here and it will start making a new uh, draw pile, which will give you more time. Also, over the course of the game, certain things might hinder you. For example, you might be freezing. And then if you have the fire resource, you can return this. There's certain ways you can help with that. Maybe you become tired and you have to rest and, and get two stars to be able to return this. Well, why would you want to return these? Because these are bad, actually. You start with one of these red hands as your character. And when you pull one that has something like this, you'd have to get rid of one of each of these cards from the draw pile for each of the red hands. So I have to get rid of three of these cards, which is shortening the game. Now the game comes with this player aid, uh, enough for all the players, which shows you what all the different icons mean, gives you some of the action consequences, shows you the different resource names. On the other side, it actually shows you sort of the, the action resolution and how to do the main things in the game. There's also other things I didn't talk about, about sometimes uh, there's ways that you cannot manipulate the numbers, sometimes everyone has to do things, sometimes it's mandatory. So there, there is more to the game than I've shown, but this should give you a good idea of how it works. All right, well, there is the seventh continent. So what do I like about this game? This game is a very thematic choose your own adventure game. When I was a kid, I used to read every night before bed and I loved choose your adventure books. You'd read, you'd get to a spot. Hey, if you want to do this, go to this page. If you want to go to this, go to that page. And I loved those old books. And this game feels like that. Now, not everything you encounter with is going to have a choice A or B, but there's definitely a lot of them throughout the game. And it's really interesting because you choose one thing or you do one thing and something happens and you'd be darned to say, oh man, I wonder what. Just the curiosity kills the cat and it kills you in this game because you're always wondering what you missed. What are you going other ways? And I love the aspect of that choose your own adventure style game. It reminds me of a game also as a kid that I played a lot called Myst. Uh, it was on, I think, the Comedy of 64 back in the day. It was this adventure where you're going around this island, you're going down in caves, and you're trying to find clues and trying to figure out what the heck is going on, what are we trying to do? And I really felt like they almost took like that Myst style experience and brought it to the modern age in the analog board game, and I love that about this. Uh, many of you know that uh, a couple years ago, my game of the year was, was Time Stories, because it was a super immersive game like nothing I'd ever experienced, cooperative, choosing your own adventure similar like this. And I feel like this had that similar pull of me uh, that, that just drew me in. It's a very immersive game uh, that you can play cooperatively with your friends. I feel like it has a lot of the great things that Time Stories did, but without all the dice rolling and all the haphazard rules that that game has. And don't get me wrong, it was my game of the year a few years ago, but uh, this one does all those great things, I think, in a better way. I like the action deck, how it's used not only as a time clock in the game, uh, but also statistics for the encounters. It's just a brilliant thing where certain, and they give you that table where a certain amount of stars you'll get with this many cards, uh, but it's like, well, how many do we want? Well, if we get this many, it's 55%. If we go this many, it's 75%. And you're really agonizing because once that deck gets to the end and you shuffle it all up, if a, if a curse card comes out, the game's over, you're dead. So it's like, you're really trying to balance that. I love that aspect of the game. Uh, this game has a lot of these little mini style sort of escape room puzzles. Uh, again, similar to some of the things that we saw in Time Stories where you're getting there, maybe you got to figure out a maze or some gears or some different little puzzle and you're trying to figure out. And I love that aspect because it's not an escape room game, but it brings some of these little mini puzzles in. And I love that aspect of this. Uh, it's cool to combine items together. And so sometimes you can only hold a certain amount of items depending on how many players uh, you're playing with, but you can combine them together and the, the cool thing is, is that when you combine them, if they have the same keyword, they can sort of, you can, you can use the dice and sort of combine between both of them. I like that aspect of it. Uh, you can uh, alter challenges together. So when you're going through the different challenges, uh, you can essentially alter the a number of cards and the number of stars you need. So it kind of encourages you to stay together in this game, which we, we do most of the time anyway. Uh, but I like how you can kind of manipulate things and, and do things better together. I like the synergies of those keywords on the card. So we talked about how those cards, they have different uh, words on them. Uh, and, and, and certain cards say, hey, if you have this card, you can do this. Uh, and I like how those synergies work different ways. Some cards allow you to do different things with those, but then cards with the same uh, keywords allow you to combine them, as I mentioned before. And I just, it's such an interesting thing where 
like uh, the person I was playing last game, the the Frankenstein, uh, what Victor Frankenstein was. Hey, if you discard a will card, you can get any card with your picture of it from the deck, uh, from the discard pile, and that's cool. So I like how they added that extra layer of mechanisms there uh, to, to do some interesting things. Uh, this game has a ridiculous amount of content. Uh, I mean, it's it's absolutely flooring. I don't know how long it took them to make this, but even the first curse. I mean, you're gonna be probably 15, 20 hours in before you finish it, and there's four courses in this, so it's like, wow. I mean, this game is absolutely amazing. It's a ridiculous amount of content. I also like the save system, which you'll probably need to use because the game is so long, where you'll want to save it, and I like it. Actually, it's pretty quick to just pick up the cards, you put them in order, you put them down, and I like that about it. Overall, the game uh, really blew me away. Anything I didn't like about it? Well, uh, after dying, uh, you know, retracing your steps from the beginning of the curse through can feel mundane to some. Uh, now, I know this was a big complaint of people in Time Stories as you'd go through different runs and start over, and some people very strongly dislike that. I think if you dislike that as aspect of Time Stories, you might not like this. I don't think it's as bad as the Time Stories one, because, you know, when you start back, maybe there's other things that you wanted to explore anyways. I didn't mind it that much, but it is a con for some people. There is an easy mode where when you die, you can just start where you left off. And I know a lot of people really like that mode. So if you don't like that aspect of time stories of starting over, you can always use this easy mode. I prefer not to, uh, because with the easy mode, you don't worry so much about how many cards you're pulling and how many stars you need to get. And it loses that, that the tenseness as to, ooh, we're, we're running down on cards. Because you can just take as many as you want, because hey, you can just start over anyways. Uh, but that is an option for you if you don't like the restarting aspect. Uh, I do wish the cards and the minis were bigger. Um, you know, spreading out the map. I play on a, quite a big table, so maybe I'm, I'm biased here. But I would like to have seen the art. And it's beautiful art. I'd just like to see it a little bit bigger. Uh, um, the saving, I said, was a pro. But also, there's a thing with saving where all the other cards you're not on basically, you know, come off. And you have to sort of re-explore those, which costs, you know, cards and time and such. And I've read online that actually it's good that that happens because it allows you to re-explore and some of those cards are good and sometimes you can get things you need. But I would much rather just, hey, if I saved, I'm going to save where I'm at. I'm going to bring it back where I'm at. Let's go. So a little tweaking to the save system I think was necessary, but uh, it, it's not a big deal. And then uh, the, probably the biggest deal for you watching this is it's not really available through normal retail channels. This game is, was pretty much only available on Kickstarter. I played it the first time uh, a, couple, a couple months ago and I instantly late backed it because I realized hey this is like a now or never thing and so i'm waiting for that to come next year i got to borrow my friend brian's copy thank you for letting me borrow to do the review brian um so it's not easily available if you didn't get it through the kickstarter then you're probably gonna have to uh you know buy a copy secondary market very expensive but overall uh i'm just gonna go out and say that this game is the most audacious thematic exploration game i've ever played it is the most immersive game I've ever played. Last night we finished another session. Uh, it was seven hours long without stopping. And I know for some of you are like, oh, that's kind of long. If you know me and my style, that is huge because I like one hour games with streamlined mechanisms. And that's the cool thing about this game. It has very streamlined mechanisms, but they're all very good. They all tie together well. And even through that seven hours, I never get tired of playing it. I was just so immersed and time flew like when you're at conventions and you're like oh we haven't eaten yet one of those things it is a game that will just offer so much play uh, in time and experiences but man is it amazing uh one probably the best exploration game made period uh so that's seventh continent i don't give very many games tens this is a 10 for sure so let's induct it properly with a saxophone serenade <laughs> This video was sponsored by Miniature Markets Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com.